Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our prep tech talk. This week's uh, talk is going to focus on the future first responder, accelerating public safety communications research. My name is Rebecca Harnett. I'm the director for national federal programs, and I'm going to open up today's prep tech talk with a little bit of background. Next slide, please. First of all, thank you all so much for joining us. We realize everyone is very occupied in the current response efforts to COVID-19, as well as some of the severe weather events across the Southeast United States. With that, we'll cover some webinar housekeeping issues, and then we'll move into a little bit of background on NAPSIG Foundation. And then I have the honor of, of introducing the team on for the future first responder with the NIST Public Safety Communications Research Division. They'll provide us with an overview of PSCR, open innovation in depth, and a research highlight on public safety UI UX. At the end of their presentations, we'll have some time for questions and answers via the Q&A feature in Zoom, which should be right in your, pan in your participant panel. And then we'll close today's session. A quick note, the slide deck supporting materials and a recording of today's session will be posted to the NAPSIG website and an email will be sent to all registered participants providing you with that link. Next slide, please. A couple of updates we wanted to share regarding web conference security. Uh, NAPSIG has implemented a number of different security me measures in our Zoom platform. All attendees and participants are muted upon entry and only the host can unmute a participant. This is set up to help prevent background noise as well as additional security. The ability for chat to chat between participants has been disabled. Only the host and panelists are provided with a secure and unique login to be able to share their screens. Additionally, participants will not be able to save the chat history. This, this feature has been disabled to ensure heightened security. Next slide, please. Lastly, we encourage you to engage and participate throughout today's prep tech talk. Due to the large audience, all participants are muted for the duration of the session to prevent background noise. Please use the Q&A functionality within Zoom for your questions. We'll be taking some questions right within the Q&A feature and answering them via that function, as well as taking some questions uh, at the very end, which we will moderate with our guest speakers today. Next. A couple of things we wanted to highlight, uh, given that we are currently uh, deep into COVID-19 response, is that NAPSIC Foundation is making an, a number of different resources available to our members in communities to support you in your response and recovery efforts. The link provided on this screen can take you right there to where those resources are available today. Next slide. And for those who are new to our organization, I want to provide a little bit of background regarding the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. Our vision is that a nation of emergency responders and leaders are equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcomes for survivors. We were established nearly 15 years ago as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And today we have a, a national member network of over 20,000 local, state, tribal, territorial, public safety leaders, first responders, and technologists and GIS staff. Here you can see just a handful of some of the associations and leaders that helped establish NAPSIG Foundation nearly 15 years ago ranging from emergency managers to police, fire service, uh, public health, and others. Next slide, please. So our real focus is on local first, ensuring a national reach, which is why we have a member network of over 20,000 members, representing 12 primary and national primary national and international associations and representing all public safety disciplines and levels of government and interfacing with the private sector. 
you can also see here a map and some charts that illustrate the 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 spread of participants in this prep tech talk today so on the map you can see our geographic distribution representing across the nation in terms of participation and then the pie chart on the upper left hand side can illustrate the breakdown of participation by local government private sector federal state government ngos and others additionally you can see participation by primary public safety discipline ranging from emergency management, 911 dispatch, EMS, search and rescue, and many others. Next slide. So how we do what we do at NAPSIG. Provided here is a slide that illustrates the framework that we, we support our community nationwide and that the foundation of our organization is providing and developing and delivering national guidelines and standards defining those standards and promulgating consistent best practices across the country. We also foster regional collaboration through different exercises, simulations, and initiatives. And then we provide capacity building opportunities in using innovative technology through education and training. And we transfer valuable knowledge and skills through technical assistance. Next. So our objectives for today, we want to ensure that you have an opportunity to learn about federal research developed to advance first responder communication technologies, receive valuable information about upcoming funding opportunities, as well as how to get, in, get involved and join the community, and gain insights on the most anticipated 2020 research news and impacts across technology areas directly relevant to support our first responder community nationwide. Next. And with that, I have the pleasure and opportunity to introduce to you our guest speakers with the National Institute of Standards and Technology Public Safety Communications Research Division, Mr. Derek Orr, the Division Chief of PSCR. And he's joined with Ellen Ray, Deputy Division Chief and Open Innovation Team Lead, as well as Scott Ledgerwood, User Interface User Experience Research Team Lead. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Derek Orr. Derek. All right, am I good? Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear, thank you. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. Um, well, I really appreciate the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, we're very excited to have this opportunity to talk to uh, the, the NAPSIG organization. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's really a, 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 an honor to be able to, uh, to utilize your network and reach out to uh, members that we may not otherwise have crossed paths with. And for us, it's so important to get as many people involved in our program as we can and being able to uh, partner and interact with organizations like NAPSIG only allows us to reach more people and have a larger impact uh, at the end of the day. So thank you for your time um, and thank you for, uh, and th thanks to NAPSIG for setting this up for us. So I'm gonna start today uh, with an overview of the program to, to baseline everybody about who we are at the Public Safety Communications Research Program and what we do. And, and to start that off, uh, really, I want to give you an idea of where we sit within the federal government and within the Department of Commerce. So uh, NIST is an or the National Institute of Standards and Technology is an organization within the Department of Commerce. And under, uh, underneath NIST uh, is a new laboratory that was created in 2014. And, and that doesn't sound new today. It's uh, 2020, but uh, NIST has been around since 1901 and has traditionally only had four to five laboratories. So the addition of a new laboratory at NIST uh, was a really big deal. And it was the recognition that communications technology is so important to the nation's trade uh, and manufacturing community and to its citizens. And so it wanted to dedicate a laboratory to focus specifically on those issues. And the Public Safety Communications Research Program, uh, although it, it, we've been around for a, a number of decades, uh, we were the first division instantiated under the new communications technology lab. So that's where we sit. And many times we get questions about how we uh, are in relation to 
FirstNet, the first, uh, first responder network authority that operates the nationwide broadband network through a contract with AT&T. Um, we are a sister agency of FirstNet, uh, whereas P PSDR sits under uh, NIST, FirstNet sits under the National Telecommunications and Information Administration that is also under the Department of Commerce. So we are sister organizations um, and PSDR and FirstNet work very closely together um, consistently uh, where FirstNet is really focused on deploying a nationwide network today and seeing it uh, improve over time, but really focused on a near-term implementation. Our focus is on a longer-term R&D program that, uh, that serves to feed them a pipeline of new uh, innovative technologies uh, that will help them better the network and better the experience for the end user. Um, so we talk weekly uh, and uh, even in the legislation that I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, we are tied at the hip. And so we're very closely um, uh, uh, partnering in all of our efforts. And in fact, they established their CTO office uh, out here uh, in Boulder where we're situated uh, and because they wanted them to be closely linked to the PSCR laboratory. Next slide, please. So our primary mission of PSCR, and this, it's been this way since uh, even before 9-11, is really serve as an objective resource for public safety, state and local public safety organizations that typically don't have the research and in engineering expertise to uh, to address a number of problems that, and, and opportunities that public safety faces. And so we serve as that engineering expertise to work with public safety organizations, help them define and understand the requirements turn those requirements into technical specifications, take those technical specifications into standards bodies, and then work with industry and academia to help those products over time, one, uh, meet the standards and understand where necessary those standards might need to be changed, the requirements might, might need to be changed um, to adapt to evolving technologies and evolving user needs. So um, that is our primary mission is to serve that, that community. Next slide, please. Our, traditionally, our, we came from a, a, an environment after 9-11 of focusing on interoperability issues for land mobile radio use uh, between public safety agencies, and that was our background. However, around 2007, 2008, it became obvious that, uh, that um, the uh, country was moving in a direction of providing a nationwide public safety network to our first responders, where one responder could roam uh, across the country and be able to speak both back to their um, home agency as well as to any agencies they might be uh, working with. Um, so we started to pivot away from legacy technology of land mobile radio and really focusing on what that future first responder would look like, how they would operate, and what needs to be done to get them to that future vision. So that's where we stand today, and that's where most of our effort is focused on uh, currently. Next slide, please. So, although we've been around uh, since before 9-11, uh, a, a very unique event occurred for us. Uh, we were typically funded by other agency funds up through uh, 2016, um, and, uh, and, and, and we probably operated off of an average of around six to seven million dollars a year. Uh, however, um, in 2012, a very unique thing occurred, which was the, uh, the passage of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act. And that's what created FirstNet, and it provided the public safety community in the United States with 20 megahertz of spectrum, which was an incredibly large amount of spectrum for our public safety community, and $7 billion that would be derived from spectrum auctions that were going to be held in the, in the following years after 2012. Um, so that was a very large sea change for public safety in the United States. That legislation also provided NIST with $300 million to support research and development that would help public safety take full advantage of that nationwide network and see them advance their capabilities into the future. So where FirstNet was able to borrow from the Treasury immediately in 2012, public, uh, PSCR had to wait for the spectrum auctions to actually be held and receipts to be deposited into the Treasury. So although we knew money would be coming, we didn't actually get that money until 2016 and really didn't get all of the money until the end of 2016. So we became fully operational in about 2017. Um, and the money came with a caveat, which is 
it expires September 30th, 2022. So we have a six, a really a six year period in which we knew we were gonna be operating and, um, and executing a very ambitious uh, R&D program for public safety, really a once in a lifetime opportunity. So we started in 2013, really focusing on working with our stakeholders in industry, academia, public safety, and especially FirstNet to identify and roadmap areas where once we got the money, we would hit the ground running and start focusing on. Um, and, and we did this over a period of four years. And what I'm gonna talk about next is the areas that, um, that, that we uh, have uh, begin, been focusing on since those meetings with public safety and the industry. So the first is, you'll see in the bottom left, LMR to LTE. So this is to ensure that for the period of time that a public safety user shows up on scene with a land mobile, land mobile radio device like they use today, and somebody else shows up on scene with a new FirstNet broadband device, that they will be able to communicate across networks. So that is, that is really the focus of that area. Next to it, you see mission critical voice. And that is about ensuring the capability of bringing forward from those land mobile radio um, technologies, the core voice communications capabilities that need to be on a broadband device before public safety could ever consider not using land mobile radio. And when we say that, what we really are mean by mission critical voice is uh, one, push to talk communications, two, efficient group communications. Uh, uh, so public safety doesn't talk one-to-one, -one, they talk one-to-many, and that can put a stress on the network. So that has to be engineered correctly so that you don't um, uh, uh, burden the network with, with that communication. And then three is direct mode communication. So device-to-device -device communications. Uh, public safety relies on that to occur if they go into a basement of a building and don't have the ability to reach back out to the network or they're in the middle of nowhere in a, uh, in a wildland fire scenario where there is no network coverage, they can still talk device to device. That is a core capability. And in all three of these areas, our LTE devices that we're carrying around today weren't really um, developed with those uh, capabilities in mind. So this whole area is really focused on bringing those capabilities forward for public safety. User interface, user experience. That's really about changing the way public safety is going to interact with the network, receiving information from the network, and giving information to the network. In their first iteration of uh, devices that they'll get from FirstNet, they're, they're pinching, they're zooming, they're swiping because they're the same devices we carry around in our pocket today as consumers. But in the future, we see public safety having heads-up displays, operating with haptic feedback, audio cues, voice commands, things like that. And that's, that's, well, that's what that whole research area is focused on, is driving that forward. Location-based services is really about tracking assets and personnel inside of buildings, uh, submeter resolution, and expecting no pre-deployed infrastructure in the building when you arrive. So that is a quite a hurdle, uh, and we're really focused on three things there, which is accurate 3D geolocation inside of the building at a submeter resolution. Uh, accurate maps of the buildings that public safety would uh, would uh, respond to. And then uh, three uh, would be once you have your coordinates and you have your map, how do you navigate from point A to point B and then back to point A. Uh, public safety analytics is focused on taking advantage of all the data that will be available to public safety across this network from sensors and databases uh, and making it usable and operational through, for them through um, analytics and AI capabilities. Uh, and so uh, we're doing a, a host of work in those areas as well. And then we have a couple of cross-cutting areas. Uh, one in security, in which NIST is leveraging its long expertise in, in cybersecurity and applying it to public safety's needs, specifically in the area of um, user authentication onto the network with their device and a single sign-on capability. Uh, resiliency is really focused around ensuring that all of these capabilities are available to the user whether or not the macro network is available. So if they're in the middle of a wildland fire, or they're in a hurricane situation where all the towers have been knocked out, they will still be able to at least have a local communications uh, capability amongst the responders. Next slide, please. So how are we doing this? We have a lot of work to do in a short period of time. We have to do 
and, and leverage as many experts and, and, and people as possible to help us get this job done. So we certainly uh, bring to, to the table a lot of expertise within NIST. So right now we're employing about 100 researchers in NIST across the laboratories that are applying their expertise to these public safety portfolios. Uh, and, and so that is, uh, uh, many of them are focused on things like developing the measurement methods by which we would even determine success or what success looks like um, in these areas. However, we also know that we have to bring on board many external researchers and experts and companies to help us achieve this in such a short period of time. We're doing that through external research, through grants and cooperative agreements. To date, I believe we've given out over $60 million in grants uh, to over 162 entities worldwide. Um, and we also developed a robust prize challenge program that Ellen's, uh, Ellen will be talking about uh, shortly in which we are really reaching out to a very um, non-traditional, unique solver community through these prize challenges that are based on the DARPA NASA models um, and, and looking to uh, really advance the state of the art uh, and, and push innovation forward by reaching out to a whole new community of, of researchers that we would normally not interact with through the traditional grant processes or the traditional um, uh, uh, contracting processes of the federal government. So the following slide, this, this, this map represents um, the entities uh, that we have funded to date uh, through both of our grants, our cooperative agreements, and our prize challenges. So we now have a, a large worldwide network of researchers focused on these issues. If we would have just backed up the clock three years ago, there would have been a dot in, in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and a dot in Boulder, Colorado, where the PSCR is headquartered. Um, and just in three years, we now have, like I said before, over 162 entities funded through these um, uh, grants and cooperative agreements that are working and focused on these areas. And this slide simply is a representation of many of those organizations that are currently uh, partnered with us, including NAPSIG, which I definitely want to point out because they are an incredibly important partner in our location-based services uh, portfolio and, and helping us look at how that capability would be integrated into public safety operations. So thank you, uh, NAPSIG, for being on the slide. Um, but as you can see, we have a number of uh, world-class organizations and companies that have joined this effort and that are uh, they're going to allow us to make this whole program a success. Next slide, please. So before I hand it off to Ellen, I just want to encourage you to do a couple of things. One is get involved uh, with us and sign up for our newsletter. We have a quarterly newsletter in which we push out any information on any new funding opportunities, any meeting opportunities, uh, any stakeholder engagement opportunities, and just keeping people updated on where our program sits. So please sign up for that if you're interested. And two, um, visit our website. We uh, put a lot of effort into putting all of our information onto our website, uh, and uh, and so it's a great resource, including all of our past conferences, all of our presentations are on there, uh, and, and I encourage you to go and um, uh, interact with that. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to do now is I'm ha handing this over to Ellen Ryan, who is the lead for our open innovation team and more and from my point of view, more importantly, my uh, deputy uh, division chief uh, that uh, keeps everything going uh, and on track at PSCR. So um, uh, with that, Ellen's going to talk about our open innovation program that she has really been instrumental in creating over the last uh, four to five years in this. So um, with that, Ellen, take it over. All right. Thank you, Derek. Um, and I'd also like to thank NAPSIG and all of you participants for joining us today and giving us the opportunity to talk about our program and especially um, our open innovation program. So before I start, I would like to say, you know, one of the exciting things that I've learned about our external research that we are able to, to conduct either via our grant program or through the open innovation program is how they have allowed us to bring a heightened awareness across new innovator communities um, to teach them and to help them and to work with them to solve the communication challenges that are faced by first responders. It's really been an, an exciting journey for all of us. 
Now I'm just going to give you just a little bit more detail on one of our two external programs, and that is the PSCR Open Innovation Program. Next slide, please. So when I say open innovation, what does that mean? Um, open innovation can mean a lot of different things to different people. Some people refer to it as crowdsourcing, citizen science, hackathons, codathons, grand challenges, prize challenges. Of these entities, um, we use prize challenges to make up the main part of the PSCR Open Innovation Program. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, we have found that there have been many benefits to our research by using prize challenges. I'm just going to talk about a few. First, the resulting solutions. We have found that they employ a mix of external researchers. This allows us to take advantage of other people's skill sets that we probably would not have within our own organization. Also, we found that the competition stimulate private sector investment by creating what we term as an innovation pipeline for the prize winner. PSCR will soon be launching two new pre-commercialization programs, which will be open to past federally funded awardees. This will be in the form of a pre-commercialization grant that will offer resources to continue with the technical demonstrations with first responder use cases or to provide technical business assistance. And we also will be hosting a virtual accelerator program. Next slide. Now we have um, gotten feedback that there are many benefits to participants as well. You know, in general, PSDR prize challenges have a shorter term timeline than our usual grant vehicle, which means that the participation and the results come relatively swiftly. We also strive to eliminate barriers of entry for all of our price challenges. Having open requirements help us to accommodate companies and teams of all sizes and resources. And then, of course, through various submission types, we can recognize different capabilities and skill sets that can all be used to solve various types of problems. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, little leg. There we go. Um, past challenges. I just want to briefly mention some of our past challenges. The Price Challenge Program started in mid-2017, and through 2019, we were able to award about $1.5 million in prizes. The one thing I'd like to point out is the diversity in our Price Challenge Program. We've had solvers create a series of PSCR information videos, We've had innovators participate in the first flight and payload drone challenge, as well as implemented virtual reality to help evaluate the user interface and the user experiences for first responders. We've, we're also addressing privacy issues in public safety data analytics. For example, the differential privacy synthetic data challenge is where participants created new differential privacy algorithms for what we call data de-identification or the ability to mask out personally identifiable information. This allows the use of these data sets across multiple public safety groups while keeping people's personal identifiable information a secret. Next slide. So what do we have going on now? A lot. Um, so please come talk with us. Um, some of our recent opportunities include the Tech to Protect Challenge. Here we held 10 codathons across the U.S. in solving 10 distinct coding tests, addressing the communication challenges that are faced by first responders. Now these 10 live events gave us a rare opportunity for us to give participants the direct experience of working with first responders and first net engineers over a period of a weekend. It was very personally gratifying for me to see the interactions and the enthusiasm of these coders as they worked hand in hand with public safety and they grasped the needs of the public safety and communications. 
The final Tech to Protect event is where we have invited the best of the best 25 teams to participate will occur online the last week of April. So just here in a couple of weeks. Another exciting challenge that we um, recently concluded is in the area of security. And it was expanding the SIM card use challenge. Here we asked contestants to explore whether the SIM card can be used as a storage container. And a SIM card is part of everyone's cell phone. <laughs> and we asked that they, to see if they can use the SIM card is a storage container for public safety mobile application credentials. Now for this challenge, we collaborated with industry partners, Knock Knock Labs and IBM Security, as well as FirstNet. Here, the contestants competed over three phases and at the end, they all created prototypes that successfully stored authentication credentials on their SIM cards. And they also built the applications that are used for those credentials to complete secure authentication with both Knock Knock Labs and IBM's platform. This challenge we saw raise awareness for the need of convenient standards-based two-factor authentication for emergency responders. And one thing that you will notice across all of our prize challenges is that we engage heavily, not just with first responders and our industry partners, but also with FirstNet. And we have found that these types of partnerships have become key to the success of our prize challenge program. Not only do they bring their technical expertise to the table, but they also bring real life public safety use cases. Now we've recently launched two new prize challenge programs. One April 1st, we launched our second drone challenge called the UAS Endurance Challenge. And this is gonna be a multi-stage challenge that promotes unmanned aerial systems technology that hopefully someday can assist first responders in their search and rescue operations. Here, the competitors will have the opportunity to demonstrate their prototypes at a live event for industry experts as well as public safety agencies next year, um, April 2021. And this week, we also launched a new data analytics challenge for public safety called the ASAP Challenge. ASAP stands for the Automated Streams Analysis for Public Safety. And this challenge is gonna focus on stimulating research and developing data sets that can be used in the detection and analysis of emergency events, primarily from live streaming multimodal public safety data. And if that wasn't enough, we also have two new public safety data analytics and three new public safety UAS challenges that are also in early development. So now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Scott Ledgerwood. Scott's the lead of the user interface, user experience portfolio that Derek talked about earlier. And he'll talk in detail how PSCR has implemented virtual reality as well as augmented reality to evaluate user interfaces for first responders including the use of price challenges in his area. Great, thank you, Alan. So with the introduction of the National Public Safety Broadband Network, public safety is going to be supplementing their traditional land mobile radio system with broadband devices like mobile phones. And these devices are going to offer them tremendous amounts of capabilities with access to things like data analytics and maps. However, the first sets of devices the first responders are going to be using will look very much like a commercial device that you or I use today. There'll be Android or iOS devices that may be slightly recognized, but as Derek mentioned in his overview, the responders will be interacting through swiping or, or tapping on icons. And these types of interfaces just really aren't conducive when you're a, a firefighter wearing 50 pounds of personal protective equipment and, and wearing heavy gloves. So within the user interface, user experience portfolio, we're really devoting a large amount of our research to better understanding those user and operational conditions and towards the development of future user interfaces like heads up displays, haptics, vocal interactions that'll fit the first responder needs. Now to support this work, we've been using uh, virtual reality and augmented reality technologies to really uh, conduct a lot of the research and to do some of this prototyping of future interfaces. 
Uh, so I'm going to spend the, the remainder of uh, today's talk talking about a little bit of our work in that regard. Uh, so before we get into uh, some of our prototypes, I, I wanted to quickly touch on what is the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality. So in, in virtual reality or, or VR, a user dons a headset uh, and they become fully immersed in a computer generated environment. Um, so really we're, we're limited only by our imagination and kind of what type of scenario we can, we can put the user in. Um, so in this case, uh, the person on the left who's uh, standing in our laboratory environment in, in Boulder, Colorado, we're able to transport them to the side of a highway where they are dealing with a, a multiple, uh, multiple patients during an MCI event. Uh, we could have equally put them in a high-rise uh, structure fire or in a kind of futuristic traffic stop. Next slide, please. Now with augmented reality, the user is still going to put on a headset, uh, but in this case, they're going to perceive the, the physical around them. Um, and, but that world is going to be augmented or enhanced through an, an overlay of virtual content. Uh, and this content could range from things like heads-up displays or holographic models, but the idea is that the user is going to continue uh, doing their regular task uh, in that real-world environment. Next, please. So at, at PSER, we're really like the idea of using virtual reality as a test bed for developing, testing, and prototyping these different types of user interfaces that we've been talking about. It lets us create realistic conditions and scenarios for the various, the various first responder disciplines while maintaining a, a low cost and a low risk. And it also maximizes the, the replay and repeatability we can get out of these environments so that we can measure the different impacts of these various prototypes. To date, we've developed a number of open sourced virtual reality environments that can be used by developers, and those are all available on our NIST GitHub page. Uh, and to encourage the usage of this testbed and to push for innovation in this space, we've launched several prize challenges where contestants could leverage these, these tools and these capabilities. So back in 2018, um, we launched a challenge that basically tasked contestants with coming up with this ideal heads up display that could convey navigational information to an end user. So kind of taking all, all the uh, R&D that's going into the LBS uh, research area uh, and looking to the future where we uh, know the, the mapping information, the indoor localization of the individual uh, in the victim's location, as well as all, all the potential hazards along the way. How do you take all that data and compile it together and then convey that to a uh, first responder in this case in an intuitive and non-invasive manner. So we launched the challenge in early 2018. We gave the contestants access to one of our, our virtual environments, in this case a complex office space that had uh, various hazards and uh, fires um, that blocked certain navigational paths um, and we, we placed some victims in, in various office locales. Uh, and the contestants took all this data and then they developed these solutions that would help the user navigate as quickly as possible uh, to that victim's location and then uh, back to the exit. Um, and what we found that was really interesting is that heading into this challenge, uh, everyone thought, you know, a, a map, a mini map, that is absolutely what I wanna know. I wanna know the location of, and the layout of the building and, and where I am at any given point in time. And what we actually saw is that those solutions actually performed the, um, the worst from a, a quantitative perspective, uh, a performance perspective, um, in that the users had to continuously reference the map and kind of reorientate themselves and where they are and, and where they're headed. Uh, and what ended up being a, a tie for first place, the, the most simplest solutions uh, that were created was basically drawing a, a clean navigational indicator, a, a line or, or arrow in front of the user that could direct them to the, the location as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. So it, last year, we wanted to kind of build on the, the successes of that heads up display uh, challenge. Uh, and we wanted to focus on a different type of interface, in this case, haptics. Um, so haptics are uh, kind of like a tactile vibration um, feedback mechanism. So think like if you, you tap on your phone, if your phone's set to vibrate and buzzes, it's, it's that type of interface, right? 
Um, so we're going to see, you know, are haptics conducive to the various first responder tasks and the environments that they operate in? Um, and, you know, what is the potential of this type of, of technology? So again, we looked to virtual reality to craft uh, some uh, very scenarios. In this uh, case, we extended it from fire to include uh, EMS, where you're treating patients during an MCI event, uh, and a law enforcement um, SWAT scenario, where you're trying to maintain situational awareness and, and have the technology direct your gaze towards um, active threats. So we, we turned over the environments uh, again to the contestants, and they developed a variety of, of haptic uh, wearables that could be used to assist in these various tasks. And if you could go to the next slide, please. And what you can see here is that in um, one of the phases of the challenges, uh, we actually had the contestants ship us the haptic prototypes, the wearables. Uh, in this case, you could see something like insoles and boots, uh, wearable vest, um, back-mounted or, or neck-mounted devices, um, as well as a variety of kind of uh, glove-based haptic interfaces. And we were able to test all these different solutions uh, in the comfort of our laboratory environment using these different virtual reality environments and scenarios. Uh, and uh, in this phase, we were able to essentially down select from uh, half of the contestants to kind of really focus on the ones that had the, the biggest potential in assisting in these various first responder tasks. And then if you go to the next slide, please. And then what we did, that was different in this challenge than from past challenges is that we want to extend to this to a uh, real world condition. So the final phase of this challenge was to take those, those wearables that were successful in the earlier phases and have the contestants integrate them into the uh, firefighter personal protective equipment because we didn't want to have that, that responder have to don anything extra when they're headed out of their, their station. And they used that, that haptic uh, to essentially navigate through a large commercial structure that was completely blacked out and, and filled with smoke. Uh, and we did runs over runs for a full day of trials with active first responders and, and technology and communication specialists as our, our judges and our subject matter experts. So on the augmented reality front, we, uh, we've talked about visual aids as a potential user interface. Um, we think it, it could be really conducive to, to certain operational environments. Um, so we've been developing a variety of proof of concepts and prototypes to really demonstrate the potential applications to the first responder community. Um, next slide, please. So one of our early prototypes that we uh, started with um, was a, a potential training application. So in this case, we worked with uh, ATF, uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, and within ATF, they have an Explosive Ordinance Division. And uh, we were talking with them about developing a potential training aid that could be a, a more immersive experience than kind of traditional uh, means of instruction. So um, they provided us with this inert uh, IED device. Um, and our developers took that and, and modeled it into 3D and essentially created this, um, this 3D model that could be viewed as a, a holographic uh, image using an augmented reality headset. Uh, and it also allowed them to expand the model into a wireframe mode where they could see all the individual componentry that made up this IED device. And so as the user is experiencing uh, this application, they can uh, view the model, rotate it three-dimensionally, expand it. As they highlight the individual components on their little dashboard in the background, it would provide uh, information about that specific uh, piece uh, of the device. And then they're also uh, prompted with a, a series of questions. And again, the idea here is that it, it creates a more uh, rich environment for instruction and, and for learning um, these, these things, opposed to kind of a traditional classroom PowerPoint style uh, method of, of teaching. So to make augmented reality really work, you need to know what your position is and, and not only where you are as a, like a person in the world, but where are the entities around you that you may wanna interact with? And uh, in addition to that, you also wanna know kind of your general pose and orientation. So essentially, where are you looking in the real world? And part of the way these systems work today um, are through tapping into things like IoT or our smart buildings and uh, those devices providing their geolocation within their data streams. And in addition, 
looking at spatially mapping the surrounding environment through things like SLAM, uh, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, they're using a variety of sensors like IMUs or infrared or depth cameras that are located on, on the augmented reality headset itself. And all these items come together uh, or have to come together cleanly so that any virtual content that is presented through the AR headset will align correctly and basically make sense to the user. You know, if any of these things are off, then it's going to result in a really bad user experience and, and potentially turn them off from this technology. So last month, we had a, a location-based services workshop uh, with NAPSIG out at PSDR in Boulder. And during that time, we were able to demonstrate one of our AR prototypes uh, that uses our Visio software to project and, and allow for interaction of a 3D model. And in this case, we took a, a slice of our building that was mapped out using LiDAR and built an incident command prototype that could be used as a, a more immersive means of tracking a response than a, compared to a traditional uh, whiteboard and marker method. So here we have two gentlemen uh, actually wearing different uh, AR headsets, a HoloLens and a Magic Leap device, and they're able to interact with and, and annotate this model in real time, you know, potentially uh, including things like entry point or, or call origin or, or other items of interest. And I heard that these two individuals may have registered for today's uh, session, so I, I do appreciate uh, both of you being part of this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so we've covered a lot today from a PSDR perspective on kind of um, our, our research areas and our, our past and, and present efforts across uh, the different uh, portfolios. I just wanted to, to touch on a few um, that I think are specifically uh, relevant to the audience. Uh, so back in 2017, uh, we launched a, a large scale funding opportunity called Public Safety Innovation Accelerator Program. Uh, and this spanned uh, pretty much all of our, our research portfolios at PSCR. Um, and resulted in over 30 awards being uh, given to various uh, industry and academia um, to work on a variety of efforts. Um, but within that space, um, around the location-based services effort, we had researchers working on new IMUs or chipsets or, or improved ways to uh, tr uh, triangulate location and provide better indoor localization and, and pre-planning uh, capabilities. In addition to that, last year, uh, we awarded uh, the Point Cloud City uh, funding opportunity to uh, three cities that teamed up with PSCR. Uh, and through that, uh, those entities are uh, using LiDAR technology to map out various uh, buildings and structures within their communities and turn that into a, a rich uh, 3D point cloud data set that could be used for uh, future research activities. Now on the, the UI UX front, um, we launched an uh, opportunity in 2018 uh, and had a, a variety of academia and industry work with us to start prototyping and developing some of these future user interfaces that could be used by the public safety community and, and really take into consideration the, you know, the potential for physical stress and, and cognitive overload and, and other elements to ensure that it's gonna be a, a, a very useful tool uh, uh, for the, the context of the operation for the end user. And then lastly, I just wanted to touch on the new iAccess uh, funding opportunity uh, where we've teamed up with NAPSIG to really kind of take all these uh, technology and, and research outcomes that are, that are coming to fruition across the board and uh, help us get these in the hands of the first responder community uh, from an operational perspective and ensure that uh, the community is trained up and, and is aware of all these great capabilities that are coming out of PSCR. And with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Rebecca. Great, thank you so much, Scott. So we just wanted to share a little bit about what NAPSIG is doing in support of iAxis uh, as a part of our NIST PSCR partnership. So earlier this year, we established the iAxis Working Group, which is a working group of local first responders and leaders that are charged with providing thought leadership and subject matter expertise on indoor mapping, tracking, and navigation. We also released last year the National iAccess Questionnaire, which is an opportunity for us to understand requirements and understand the existing adoption of indoor mapping, tracking, and navigation technologies. And by way, I'd just like to offer it, that this is a call to action. So if you are with a first responder agency, we strongly encourage you to take five minutes to complete the questionnaire. And there will be a QR code also at the end of today's presentation. 
it's a great way to get involved and include your agency's experience and what you've done in terms of adopting some of this tech. Additionally, coming this June 2020, we'll be launching the IAXIS Innovation Toolkit and Community. We're really excited about this and this will be publicly available for all of you to use the toolkit as well as engage and join in the IAXIS community. And I'll be giving you a sneak peek as to what that IAXIS platform is going to look like. And as well, currently we are in the process of developing a web-based best practices guide for implementing indoor mapping, tracking, and navigation technology. And one thing I'd like to mention about this is that it is not a technical guide. This is a practical implementation guide for first responder agencies to be able to use in guiding the way as to how they adopt and implement the latest and innovative technology. And lastly, I'll just mention that uh, we will be conducting as a joint effort with NAPSIG and NIST PSCR an IAXIS workshop as a part of the 2020 NIST PSCR broadband public safety meeting. I included a link to where you can go to, to get the latest information about that meeting and consider participating. Next. So provided here is a preview of what is to come this coming June in the IAXIS Innovation Toolkit and Community. You can see this whole environment will be virtual and highly engaging and dynamic and an opportunity for you to engage directly peer-to-peer uh, -peer and have some great interaction and support of indoor mapping, tracking, and navigation. And with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Scott. Thanks, Rebecca. So I, again, I know that everyone's heard a lot about kind of our, our recent challenge opportunities, and I, I just want to kind of take the moment to do one, one more shameless plug about a recent challenge that we just launched uh, within the UIUX and the IoT uh, research areas of, of PSER. Um, so the Chariot Challenge, uh, it's really focused on improving public safety response by accessing IoT information through more usable interfaces. And it's actually split up into two contests, one focused on the augmented reality community, uh, tasking them with creating heads up displays and holograms for first responders and incident command. And then the other is targeting kind of the data scientists and research communities within the IoT space. So with, within the Chariot Challenge, contestants are going to be building uh, applications that leverage IoT data from personal area networks and smart buildings and smart cities and creating these visual aids that provide actionable information to the first responders. And these applications will be used by our, our judges, you know, active first responders and, and technology specialists to complete a variety of tasks for four different scenarios, active shooter, flood, wildfire, and a mass tra uh, transit accident. Um, the total price purse of this challenge um, is $1.1 million. Um, and we are looking for public safety to be a, a large player as part of this challenge. Uh, we think incorporating the user, uh, the first responder in this case, in the development process really results in better solutions. And PSER has included prize awards for first responders to work with contestant teams uh, and, and to support their time and, and travel for potential training and, and feedback in collaboration with the contestants. Um, the submissions are due the first week of May for concept papers. However, um, there is an opportunity for public safety to get involved up until phase two, which takes, um, which uh, culminates in, I believe, June of this year. So there is still some time to um, reach out to PACR and let us know if you would be interested in, in potentially collaborating this. Um, more information can be found at chariotchallenge.com. And I just wanted to thank uh, everyone on behalf of PACR for your time and attention today. Uh, we greatly Appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit more about our program and look forward to uh, the collaboration with NAPSIG uh, in the future. Excellent, thank you so much, Scott. And also thank you to Derek and Ellen as well for your presentations and, and speaking engagements today. Uh, and we have a couple more slides and then we are gonna cover a few questions and answers. So what we wanted to highlight for you are some opportunities to take action and uh, ensure you know what's next. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we highly encourage those with first responder agencies to participate in the National IAXIS questionnaire. Provided here is the link, I've also provisioned it out in the chat feature within Zoom. And then you can also use the QR code uh, as well uh, to be able to participate in the questionnaire. 
Additionally, we highly encourage folks uh, to participate in the upcoming 2020 broadband public safety meeting. Exact dates for that are to be determined, but if you uh, hear Derek's call to action to join the mailing list and keep an eye on the website, you'll certainly learn more there. And from NAPSIG's end, we have an upcoming prep tech talk uh, focused on the innovative PIO, and that is slated for May 2020. So please stay tuned as we will be launching registration for that prep tech talk soon. Additionally, NAPSIG is still planning to conduct our Innovation Summit for Preparedness and Resilience 2020 this coming October 27th to 29th in Salt Lake City, Utah. Consider this a save the date and stay tuned for more details and registration opening in late July. Next slide, please. Great. So now I'd like to take an opportunity and moderate just a couple of questions that have come in through the Q&A feature in Zoom. So the first question I'd like to uh, surface here to our panelists and, and just be sure that you unmute your lines before answering um, is, do you ever interface with the film and visual effects community around the world? So much of the technological software that is being seen is used with the industry for a very long time. VR location presentations and presviz interaction is a normal part of most production nowadays. Uh, Scott or, or Derek or Ellen, would you like to take a, a crack at answering this question? Yeah, hi, this is uh, Scott Ledgewood. Um, so, so great question and, and what we've actually seen is that a, a lot of our uh, current recipients of the 2018 funding re, um, opportunity around user interface, user experience, uh, actually came from either the game development industry or the music and film industry, where they had a lot of kind of past experience using these similar types of software. Um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting technology area in that um, PSER had to kind of look at an entirely new different uh, skill set to really address this aspect of uh, prototyping and developing uh, new user interfaces. So yes, we, we quite often interact with kind of the, the film industry and, and the gaming community to kind of really enable this capability. Thank you, Scott. We have some additional questions here. Um, what are the international standards that enable multi-users provider integration, such as smart buildings, live streams into Cloud City or iAccess output? Uh, I think this is somewhat of a technical question, but ties to the standards community. Um, would any of our panelists like to uh, provide some insights on that question? Yeah, so this is Scott again. Um, I, this is definitely a question I think that we'll probably want to have our location-based services lead uh, follow up with because I think that's going to be a key component of it. But I know uh, from our perspective, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, uh, Open Geospatial Consortium and kind of identifying how to uh, represent kind of these twin cities, this, this virtual representation of the world and making sure everything aligns um, aligns well so the information that's presented to the end user uh, is of high quality. And then on the IoT end, I know we're exploring a lot of different types of, um, of protocols and, and communication types within the Chariot Challenge to kind of see really what is uh, performs best for the end user's experience. Um, so we'll be looking at things like MQTT protocols uh, for streaming that IoT data, as well as tapping into a variety of cloud services and, and streaming that content down. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Derek, did you wanna add anything else here? No, I'm good. Scott dealt with that. Fantastic. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So this concludes our prep tech talk today on future first responder. And I want to thank in particular all of our panelists from NIST PSCR for joining us and leading the discussion today. And obviously thank all of you for participating. We truly hope you found today's session beneficial and we will be sending out a recording uh, as well as the slides from today's session. Uh, to all of our participants and the link to that information. And with that, we hope you all stay well and healthy, and we look forward to being in touch with you all soon. Thank you again so much.